Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. Last time we had you on, we talked a lot about George DeMorn Shield, and I still can't spell his last name properly and not even going to attempt it. But welcome back. Thank you so much. It's uh, been a while. I always talk about the JFK topic. Before we get into the JFK subject, how have you been? I've been great. Uh, when I got your email, uh, I think it was on April Fool's Day, so I thought you were joking about wanting <laughs> me back. <laughs> I totally forgot April 1st is April Fool's Day. I had so many people like, are you, like I would message or say something. And they'd be like, are you, are you know, it's April Fool's Day, right? I'm like, yeah. I was like, you do you not want to hang out? They're like, I can't tell if you're playing with me. I'm like, no, I don't do that. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't. I'll, I'll joke around the other 364 days. <laughs> but not not on a, a special designated holiday. Nah, it just feels too cliche. Uh, but Nancy, when it comes to the assassination, we only talked about George DeMornshield. We never even got into your really thoughts on the assassination. Like where if you do believe conspiracy, where do you believe conspiracy? Well, I I think I started down the conspiracy path because I couldn't buy the Oswald did it alone. So based on evidence, uh, whether it be the the ballistic or it be the um, medical evidence, or the uh, crime scene evidence, that just didn't lead me to Oswald alone. And because the uh, evidence had uh, the appearance of being tainted, uh, both at the crime scene and later on in the hands of the Dallas police and also the FBI and the Secret Service, there's a certain amount of that that you can chalk up to trying to cover yourself after the fact. So you're completely benign and innocent of any wrongdoing uh, other than that maybe you were negligent uh, in performing your duties that day. And so to cover that up, then that got melded with covering up uh, information and evidence uh, that showed complicity. And so in the midst of all of that, the inconsistencies in the evidence, um, witnesses, um, eyewitness, earwitness, et cetera, I came to the conclusion that I couldn't believe the Warren report and the FBI uh, results that said that Lee Oswald did it alone. And so there go, there, ergo, you are uh, moving down the path of conspiracy. And as you've probably heard from many people, there are many paths on that road. Uh, uh, there's any group that you could think of, there's at least a dozen people that would try to substantiate uh, that that particular group or individual was the key uh, mover and shaker of the assassination. I think if you, you wanted to pick any theory, you could probably pick anybody. I think John Orr says it the best, where it's a fantasy story that's filled with mob figures, uh, corrupt FBI, corrupt police officers, evidence manipulation, literally magical bullets that can just bend gravity and make things work. He goes, anything that you want, you have it there. And that's what makes it such a problem. And I appreciate your perspective because I think you can look from kind of someone who's been involved with it a long time to where I'm at, where I've only less than a year have been trying to catch up on all the information. And you realize that it is very hard. I mean, what is your perspective on the newer generations or new interest into the assassination with the number of researchers, the number of theories out there, and plus the people that want to also double down on the official version as well, too, that say that there's no conspiracy? I think um, time is one of the key issues. Um, historians used to believe that time gave us wisdom and perspective on events of the past because you could jettison yourself out of the emotional um, uprising associated with the shock of an event uh, or the surprise of an event. And in then uh, over time, you could put it into better perspective, therefore understand it better and have a more rational mode of thinking about it. Unfortunately, in this particular case, uh, the current generation is left with a time warp of 60 years, and it is incredibly difficult to convey to people that have little cognizance of the Cold War of the 50s and 60s and what that, how that transpired 
and how it affected policy making. They have no concept of what the active voice of the populace was in the 60s and 70s and how important that voice was. I mean, it eventually ended a war in Vietnam. So it was a very uh, dominant uh, situation going through those 10 years or so. And then finally, for the time, uh, trying to help people understand not the romanticism uh, of the Kennedys and the Kennedy administration, but what that administration truly accomplished, which was to give the idea to citizens that it was a new way to look at being a citizen of this great country at the time. And that with that citizenship came responsibility. So that's the ask not uh, phrase out of uh, the inaugural address. So it's hard to convey that to people today because of things like the Peace Corps, um, recognizing poverty in uh, Appalachia, uh, where people just didn't have any visibility to that until the Kennedy started to bring that out. Uh, the civil right, rights, uh, starting the groundwork on that, the race to the moon, which was a, a, a challenge to everybody and how that inspired people. You know, he he, he was kind of, Kennedy, I think was kind of looked at like by college students as, you know, a rock star or a big football star, the way we uh, glorify them today. Uh, and uh, and it, it jettisoned a lot of people into careers that didn't stop when he was assassinated. They continued on with that. So trying to convey that spirit to the generation today to help them understand why it's important for us to recognize and admit what happened on that day, that it wasn't a freak accident of one individual, but that it was a coordinated attempt to basically have a coup. And maybe we have a better chance of doing that now that we almost had a coup on January 6th uh, a couple years ago. And so this generation has witnessed what can happen with just one individual leading people. Well, you don't maybe, I wouldn't consider it leadership, but at least directing people. And then this way then um, fomented the uh, environment that allowed people to exhibit their worst behaviors. What are some red flags I would say you could raise to some people that are maybe like if you're treating me as if I didn't know anything about the assassination, which if you listen to the comments, obviously some people feel that way, that I don't know much about the assassination. But I have learned a lot about the Cold War, and I can tell you that if you look into the this day in Dallas and why this event is so controversial and there seems like there's so much evidence, to me that's really weird. I mean, how many things were going on in Dallas at the time that you can either chalk up to a coincidence is what I usually hear as a rebuttal, but at nowhere. I mean, if, if this would have happened anywhere else, would there have been this much documentation with these many figures with extensive backgrounds? It seemed like everybody's a CIA informant or there's something going on. I mean, that's to me is one of the strangest things. And also Oswald getting a job at the book depository a month before it was even the route was even published in a newspaper. And then you go to a theater after everything. Like those are some easy things I usually bring up and people tend to go, yeah, that is kind of suspicious. Like what's the logical conclusion of that? I go, I don't know. You figure it out. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. There's a new cable show that's out called um, Night Agent. And it's a 10 part series uh, about a man who's an FBI agent that his office is in the basement of the White House. And his job is to sit by the telephone that you hope never rings. And it's for all of the night agents, and that's a term for the spies of the government. And so this is a phone, a safe place for them to call, and they can get any information they need. They can communicate safely on a secure comm line, et cetera. And so eventually through the whole story, uh, without making it a spoiler, you see the um, the use of the FBI the use of the U.S. Secret Service, et cetera, in a planned assassination attempt. And it's as I watched this over the last week, I kind of had my mouth open a few times. And I thought, uh, boy, that really illustrates how you absolutely have to have the Secret Service on board 
in order to get that close to the president, no matter where you are. Uh, this particular situation happened at Camp David, but we have the situation of Dallas, Texas. And I just thought, wow, this is interesting. 60 years later, there's a movie like this that makes no reference to the Kennedy assassination that actually has a lot of pretty good information in it uh, about um, details about how those those um, government agencies work. You think that a lot of people, at least new to the assassination, should look into the Cold War a little bit to be able to understand it more? Like I can understand the height of communism, but you also mentioned the times of the Cold War and the political climate. I bring up this question. I'm probably sure you've heard me ask other people on my show about this, but I think Nixon, if he would have beat Kennedy, we wouldn't have had the bad history that we do on Nixon. It just seemed like Kennedy and his debates had ushered in a lot of things, talking about space being the new frontier for science and things that sound normal to me because I'm of this generation and wasn't a part of that time back then. But back then, trying to analyze from that political climate was had to be revolutionary. I mean, Nixon's whole argument was we're going to be tough on communism and this whole aspect of things. And if you want to say that's one of the reasons why maybe Kennedy was taken out was because of the soft on communism attitude. I mean, things he was saying was more objectives of peace rather than objectives of, you know, muscling down the other country to make sure that you stay strong. And if you examine Alan Dulles, for instance, much like Sidney Gottlieb, everything he was doing when it came to like certain government projects, MK Ultra, which Alan Dulles probably, I mean, he signed off on, but he doubt he knew what was exactly what was going on. But certain things, actions that Alan Dulles had when it came to, you know, things that we would see as unethical or maybe horrible things. I mean, to him might've been, I got to do what needs to be done to save the country that I love, a sign of patriotism, which back then a blind patriotism towards your country did not care about the rights if you labeled somebody a communist or if you considered somebody a problem. So you have someone like a Curtis LeMay uh, as part of you know the Pentagon apparatus, and that was absolutely his philosophy was that anything was justifiable in the defense of your country. And so how you define that defense of country becomes very important. Uh, I think when Kennedy got his first briefing from the Pentagon on what a first strike would look like with a nuclear weapon and the number of people that it would hit on both sides with the retaliatory measure, uh, when those military people spoke to him about that in the room, it was very matter of fact. This happens, the bomb is let go, and it's going to strike here because it's the most populous city, and this many people will die instantly upon impact. And then this many people will die in the next 30 days, and this many in the next six months, and this many in a year. And when they walked out of the room, Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy were heard to say, and it was John Kennedy saying it, and we call ourselves the human race, right? Everything was being talked about as if it was just, you know, chess pieces on a board. We would have to do this. And they, the military had no qualms about it. It was, in fact, what they felt was necessary to save the country. Now, I don't doubt that some nefarious people who could, mili who could financially gain from the president being taken out did not use that apparatus and help influence it. But the bottom line is only the government had access to what needed to be in place that day and cover up over the next hours, days, months, and over the next year until they issued the Warren Commission. And then the ongoing uh, keeping of information from the public, um, the groveling that the citizens have had to do to get information uh, released in little smidgens at a time. And, and we, we have the latest, even with the current president, that it's still national security. It's just hard pressed to believe that. Did you ever file any Freedom of Information Act requests to get access to anything Kennedy related? I did. Uh, and I, I have this one interesting file that's about a foot thick, and it's the different responses that I got over 
a 14 year period. And it was on some information on um, Vietnam policy of the president. And so why it's so thick is because each time I succeeded in getting them to give me something, it was a little less redacted. So like the first set of 42 pages has a lot of black on it, right? And then the second set has a little less. And then, I mean, it was to the point of taking a sheet of paper and because those were regular typewriters at the time, from the early 60s and late 50s, um, counting the spaces and trying to figure out what letters would take that amount of space, right? Because every letter was not equidistant like you can get in a font today on the computer. And trying to figure out, okay, of these list of names that we know, what could fit in there? <laughs> and so you were trying to guess at what the composition of some of these documents were. And so um, I also tried to get the FOIA um, file on myself. Because in college, I had done speeches. I had gone over to Berkeley and worked with some of the people over there that were in computers to help me um, computerize my little three by five name index cards to try to get some type of a, a data and rudimentary database going. And I knew that they were under surveillance from documents that we had seen. And so I knew that I probably got captured in that net, not that I was a target. And what I eventually found were FBI, I mean, it took me years to get my file. Uh, and what I eventually found was they had inter they had sent the FBI Sacramento uh, office uh, information. And this is from J. Edgar Hoover directly. And here I'm a college student and they're sending a, a letter to the, SAC, uh, the SAC in Sacramento telling him to interview me and do a, a, a mini background check on me. So I found out through these documents that they interviewed my roommate. They interviewed the president of the college that I went to and these different things. And it's kind of, it was like, wow, my roommate never told me this. So they they either do it under a guise or they do it and, and threaten you and scare you so much that you, you'll, you'll never tell about it. Did you, did you feel scared after finding out all that? No, because I was way grown up by that time. That I was in my 40s when I was able to start to get my hands on that. Yeah. And uh, they, I at a certain point, I couldn't get any more information on me, which was silly because that was when I was most active at conferences and writing articles and, and those type of things. Uh, and yet they were telling me there was there was nothing on me. But of course, you know, they play the spelling game too. Oh, you didn't have Nancy J. Words, my maiden name. You just said Nancy Words. We don't have a file on Nancy Words. We have a file on Nancy J. Words, you know, things like that. So you go back and forth. No, we don't have it at headquarters. You'd have to go to your local FBI. You go to your local FBI and they say, oh no, everything is filed with HQ. And so you, 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 it's a paper chase that you're going on with them. And you, a lot of people, I mean, I had a full-time job. I had I had to pay my way through life. And yet uh, I, I was up burning the midnight oil trying to do this stuff. And these are, these are citizens. This is the job that the government should have performed for us. Damn, I wish I had a file. I would be awesome to know that the FBI has a file on me. I'm telling you that much. No, but the, the water, during Watergate, they were, pushing documents saying, oh, that's the FBI's file, that's the national security's file, that's this file, that's this file, and really having them run around in circles where someone, and I think in a court testimony, it was the same one with Jack Ruby was in as well too, where he made the official statement of like, they gave me cancer, and the judge is like, what are you talking about? Um, th before that, they talked about this is a tactic that the agencies use to keep you hounding for documents and looking and getting all this basically goose chase trying to get documents when really they could just give you the answer and they were just trying to clear it down a little bit to be able to get the document the guy was requesting for but when it comes to i mean national security that word i'm just like define it please that's it like just ask the agencies to define it because they've left it as an open door policy which is like i had a buddy that was just making a site about area 51 his name's Yorg Arnu. he got raided and thirty thousand dollars worth of his stuff was destroyed, and some of the stuff was taken, and then he seven thousand dollars worth of legal fees, and he was a patriot, but he had no idea about the church committee, or any of these types of things that exposed. And it was like, yeah, there's a serious problem when it comes to national security, 
which I do believe in secrecy in some aspects, of course, if it was going to put someone overseas at risk. That's a, an important issue. But the way that they use it is they just label really anything that they want to keep classified for so long. I mean, these JFK documents should be released. It's been 60 years. We shouldn't have any more secrets. And if you don't believe conspiracy, then, I mean, it doesn't matter. You're still on the same boat of wanting these documents out there. Uh, I don't see the area being national security anymore after this amount of time. And why would they keep them secret still? Because there's intelligence operations that they're still using? Well, to me, that's an even bigger issue because we were very involved in Latin America when we shouldn't have been involved in Latin America. And if that stuff's still going on today, I think we should know about certain tactics. That, 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 that's right. Uh, it's um, th 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 When you say the current generation, what, what, what is your cutoff time for that? People that are up to what age? Uh, I mean, you guys technically really deserve it more than anybody when it comes to document releases. But when I talk about my current generation, I would say probably millennials, um, younger as well, too. I would put more interest in them. Okay. So you could kind of like the third wave of, of researchers. I think the, the, the first wave is right at the time and going forward. And then about... 12, 13 years later came the second wave because that's when more books were being written. Uh, people were getting contracts to actually get with some of the mainline publishers and get their thoughts out there. And so that was kind of where the second wave came in. And then the third wave came in after Oliver Stone's movie. Okay, so that's the early 90s. And so uh, even with those people, I'm seeing some of them start to get a little burnt out. Like how much, how many times can you debate what was the size of that paper bag that they found at the depository? You know, you you either believe one way or another way, and uh, it's uh, it's it's very challenging to continue to have discussions when people come into the blog or the 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 forum uh, that's online and they're asking very basic questions. And you want you want to encourage people, you want to bring them along and direct them to places, but there's really so much that you have to read before you can even start to talk about it. Otherwise, you're just speculating and conjecturing on what may or may not be. So that's another challenge with the current generation who is more into instant gratification because you want something, you go on your phone and you get it. Uh, you want food delivered at two in the morning, you go on your phone and you get it. You want to find out what's going on in some other part of the world, you go on your phone and you get the information. They're so used to that kind of access. And with since 9-11, the whole idea of national security, no one will define that for you. Because we gave up so many rights on 9-11 with the Patriot Act of what the government was allowed to do. And so um, there was a lot of between the lines that came into that with what we did with prisoners, uh, whether it was in you know, the waterboarding or whatever. But again, that's those activities are done primarily, I believe, by people who consider themselves patriots. It's just not the way I would define a patriot. Yeah. There's those cancer cell injections was a big one as well, too, especially at an Ohio penitentiary, which happened a year before Jack Ruby even made a statement about a cancer cell injection. Um, there's a lot of things that I think through the Kennedy assassination, I just looked in the past to try and find. I mean, when you want to know what your government's up to, COINTELPRO is a good example of what how far the FBI would go to device devise populations. I mean, inserting free radicals into the Black Panther Party. Um, they did other domestic things. They labeled domestic terrorists as well, too, KKK, a bunch of things. But they went so far as to writing the Black Panther Party leaders' wives and say that your husbands are sleeping around with teenagers, where it was just like, that's a low blow, but it really kind of showed how far they would go to going to an apartment building that a meeting would be held at, make an anonymous phone call saying that these members are being disruptive and aggressive and there might spark up a riot just so the police can come in. And that was well-known tactics. It's agent provocateurs. We see that on university campuses in the 70s and 60s. Um, certain people dressed up that were cops, dressed up in civilian clothing just to be able to move protesters out of the way by either throwing a brick or doing anything of these sorts. I've 
learn that whole gambit of history. So it's not like it all comes out in the Kennedy assassination, but this one is so important and has had so much documentation on it and has many different camps of people that believe whatever different theories that they want, where I honestly don't recommend any new generations getting into it. At least when I talk to my friends, I'm like, you have to find someone who you can agree with on certain aspects and give them the breakdown of it. Because if you try and join the forum, and I don't recommend that to anybody, it's too divisivized where there's just yelling and arguments back and forth. I mean, it's literally labeled JFK debates. Where it's like it's I see the same thing getting rehashed in multiple different forums. And if you're new to the assassination and you're got an interest, my first experience into it, horrible experience. But I learned like you start kind of developing what the community is and how people work, and you find good people like yourself that are willing to explain to someone who's looking to understand it as well, too. But that's I I don't I don't know how that problem gets fixed. I mean, you're you were probably there from when the, the forms of JFK first kind of started getting created when you started realizing there's a lot of researchers that actually care about it. I mean, you've noticed it probably better than I have. Right. It's um uh but but it goes back far beyond that. I mean, that was just another vehicle uh by which uh controversy could be stirred. And and I'm convinced that some people were injected into the forums simply to cause disarray. Right. Get. I mean, shoot. Our, let let them. Let us all talk amongst ourselves and shoot ourselves in the foot. You know, the the circular uh, death squad. Right. Of uh, we don't need to have the government come in and try to squash somebody. Uh, we can let all these people go after each other. And so that's what's happened a lot. But it's happened many, many times. And you know what I what I've seen transpire now is people that have researched. And, um, and and believe that, or not researched, but have come to a conclusion that it's the single assassin that did it, and it's completely plausible, and it's the reality of what happened that day, uh, will now use an argument of an elite stature that, what? To believe anything else, you, you're really... You're really not with it. You're you're not very cool. You're not very uh, informed. Okay, and so it's it's that type of a thing. Uh, it, it reminds me back, like in high school, when someone tells a dirty joke, and you laugh at it, and you laugh at it because you really don't understand it. You know, you you you're you're too naive uh, about yeah yeah you're you're too naive about to really understand what what the dirtiness is about the joke, but you don't want to appear that you don't that you're not with it and you don't understand it, um, and that's what's kind of being done now. So you have people like Tink Thompson writing articles and doing little blurbs on the internet that uh that that talk very intellectually about it. Uh, this the the de some of the details some of what people call minutia which is just detailed information uh, but calling it minutia denigrates it right so using terms like that and making it seem that if you're really intellectually um, inclined you would understand how there is just a singular assassin uh, but but in other words you're just not smart enough to accept that and figure that out. And, uh, and and I don't know how that plays today with the modern generation of um, how much do they want to figure out about anything, okay? Not just, not just this event, but even current events. How much do they want to know? Because you, once you know something, you know of an injustice, you know of something that's not right, aren't you supposed to act on it? But if you don't know, you can merely go along in life, live your life, and we know it's hard enough living your life. We've just been through a pandemic where people had to stay in their homes. They had to disassociate with people, family, friends, work. All of their social networks were, were ripped un, under from underneath them, and it's understandable that it needed to be done. We had not gone through a pandemic like that in 100 years. So... Uh, how much do people really want to know because how much do they want to act? That would be my question for a modern generation. And if I, you can't go to a place like a forum, like you're talking about and uh, 
uh, have a, a healthy conversation, where are the avenues? Some dangers I've noticed I want to get your thoughts on are some things that I don't mind somebody making a profit off of certain things. It's not the way I would go about certain things. Um, but I've kind of noticed that people that had some great stuff in the beginning either keep beating the same horse on some aspects, but also I've heard some things that get recommended on some six floor interviews and I'm not calling out anybody. I'm sure they're great researchers, but there are some statements that I've heard where it's about as insane as Jack Ruby not shooting Oswald as that statement out there where I go, hold on, you were like a respected researcher. And I, you did some great stuff in the beginning, and I don't want to mention his name. You already mentioned his name. But something as like the Zapruder film, Kennedy's head only goes back because the handshake of the Zapruder film makes it look like it goes back. Where I'm just like, all right, hang on a second. Like, I'm not trying to say that that's nonsense, but that's that's nonsense. Even any anybody that tried to rationalize the video as well, too, whether it's a PBS documentary or anything like that, they never even suggested that there was a handshake of the Zapruder film that did that type of thing. But I hear something like that and I go, I don't know. I mean, I don't trust that. So does that mean I can't trust things that you did in the beginning that were good? And that's like a lot with a lot of researchers and not to throw shade at anybody and not David Lifton is a, a good example too. Great work in the beginning, but then mess people are always messaging him saying, Hey, can you want to do this? Like I didn't try to ask him on an interview or something. He was working on a next project, yet we don't have that next project. We don't know what that next thing was going to be. And then it's like you really – and when you get in your research bubbles, it gets in a crappy position of like – I mean you need money as well too, which like I said, I don't throw shade at anybody that makes money off the research. But also trying to get this to the public, you know, people to actually care about it as much as I care about it, as much as plenty of other people have spent their whole lives researching into it. It's a little bit more important than just keeping it to yourself, but I think it enters that territory of this is one of the biggest controversial investigative things ever. Are you going to be the person that solves it? And I, I don't view it that way. I know some people kind of like might view it that way, but I think at this point, anyone that solves it, it's everyone's work. I would not – if I solved it, it wouldn't be anything because it, I came from all the work of every other researcher out there. It's all credited to them. It's a community effort, not a – one single person. Well, that, that that's true, and uh, and that comes to sharing, right? So, if you're of the mode of sharing research, etc., uh, then that goes by the wayside because. Uh, but there's too much of this was my witness. I was the first one to ever talk to this person, and that's great. It's good for us to know when you first made contact and that. But then let's open it up to a real uh, microscopic look, because even if you're the first person to interview someone, you are one person and you bring your perspective, your biases, et cetera. Even when someone's ask, answering a question to you and you've recorded it and you have all that on film or tape or whatever, um, you still are interpreting it a certain way, whereas someone else could could take it differently. And that's why you need, um, that's why in science there's peer review because you write a paper on quantum mechanics and then you get it out there for your peers to review and tear it apart and all of that. So that by the time uh, that happens and is accomplished, you have a more unified theory about what, you, what, what you're trying to express. And, um, and we need more of that healthy type of of understanding and debate within the Kennedy, but it's more accusatory, my way or the highway type of scenario, which, which is too bad. I'm working on a project right now that I'm very passionate about. I've been working on it for about a year, it has nothing to do with George um, or the pains, which are the two areas that I've worked on in the past. And um, I'm bedeviled by it. Uh, I'm doing it night and day. I'm dreaming about it. I'm, uh, and I'm completely frustrated because one day I will think one thing, the next day I'm going down another path because I found another statement or I found uh, another person that I can talk to that can tell me uh, another perspective. So there is research to be continued Absolutely, because this is so complex, this case. Um, Can you talk about what it is? I, I'm not ready to yet, okay. 
uh, and uh, but um, I I'm very enthusiastic about it. Uh, but just like with George, everybody wants to believe George was Lee's handler, and I just don't see it. I don't see the evidence of it. It's just it's a nice little comfortable myth to have. And I can't tell you for sure who his handler was, who Lee's handler was, but I can I can negate certain things. And by negating certain things, you you can set that to the side and start to then dwell on other information that could be more fruitful about finding out who exactly was that person that was doing that and doing the the puppet master behind the scenes uh, that we we haven't yet identified even perhaps. Do you think that comes from the tenseness in the community where people start going and doing like what a lot of researchers do, which is go in their bubbles and do the independent research? Like I, like I said, I respect David Lifton's work, Best Evidence. I respect William Law's interviews. I respect all these people, but I've started to notice the close knit where it's like, if you have this person on, then that person will do it and that person won't do it. And it's like, okay, so there's a lot of back history that I don't know about and walking kind of blindly into it all of wanting just to talk to everybody and get their perspective on it. But it's because we never united on the conspiracy front at all. It everyone you get really separated, and it, it's hard. You spend thirty years researching into something, forty years and in researching into something, and you have your own theory. And then someone comes in with their theory, and their theory blows yours out of the water. You get defensive. It's same thing with academics and research studies. But it's really important that as much as you might separate on the details, it doesn't need to lead to like banning, blocking, and then writing articles about certain individuals. It just needs to be expressing this in an open way to where pick on some protégés. I mean, I think Matt Dohit got some of Lifton's work or had some conversations with Lifton. That's good because if he passed away with everything in his brain doesn't really help us if it's not in a journal or if it's not written down. And that's why I think it's so important to get interviews like Malcolm Blunt's interviews uh, that Bart Camp does, Vince Palomaro with plenty of his uh, interviews that he's done as well too. It's important to have that information logged down, whether it's in a book or whether it's in video platform, so you can try and understand what this person had experienced. Now, some things are hearsay. You know, I like William Law's explanation of it. He goes, I can't tell you what happened but I could tell you what they said to me. And that is like, to me, it's like, I accept that a lot. Now I'm not going to use it in court because it just won't last. But when I hear someone telling me what they've been told, you can sense when someone's giving you a lie or they're just telling you exactly what was said to them. And to me, that carries more weight when I can have a conversation with someone about it. And it doesn't immediately turn into a finger pointing and arguing about it because that's not how you learn. That's right. But if people are very proprietary about their information, so you're, I say that, and then you're, you're thinking, well, Nancy, you just told me you're working on something, but you don't want to talk about it yet. The reason I don't want to talk about it is because I still have several more interviews, key interviews to do, and I don't want to spook people and scare them away. I wasn't relating it to your work at all. I'm sorry. No, but I'm, I just, I want to show you the comparison, right? Uh, of that. There's a time for being proprietary. And then there's a time when you reveal all and you share it so that people can say um, yay or nay on it. And not just because they have an emotional reaction to it, but they're they're really looking at the evidence. I was reading an article by Pat Spear. I don't know if you've talked with him. Pat Spear? I would, I'd hardly recommend it. He's in Southern California. He's sanity personified uh in terms of evidence uh and and looking at evidence and he's he's done a rather lengthy paper on the paper bag that was found in the depository and uh he knows every measurement of it he knows the pictures that were taken of the uh, that day of it taken out of the building he knows he has crammed so much information in this article and he put it out for scrutiny and he got scrutiny. He got people very upset with him and saying he was misinterpreting. Okay, then fine. Show me where I'm misinterpreting. I'm not a photo. He said, I'm not a photo expert. So tell me, show me where I'm misinterpreting that. And it, <clears throat> it was such a healthy approach to an issue that's very important. Okay. Because the fun of ben, one of the fundamental frame framing devices against Oswald 
needed to have that rifle in the building that day. Okay. Now, I've heard one researcher say, oh, well, Ruth Payne took it down to the police department directly herself. It was never in the depository. And it's like, well, when did that happen? You know, did you, you have a time stamp on that photo of her delivering it there or something? And of course, there's nothing. Well, it's like, oh, well, she's a nefarious character. And so she she did this. I don't need that kind of stuff. I need, why doesn't the photo of the alleged sniper's nest show the bag in place when it shows the hulls of the, of the rifle and the the um, the lunch bag and these other things that uh, are not necessarily as important, but of this bag that's very important to get the, the rifle into the building uh, is not there. So any, he, I would hardly recommend getting hold of Pat Spear. And if you want me to send his contact information to you, I'd be happy to do it. You're saying hardly recommend. Heartily. Oh, Heart. okay. Like, I was like, why are you is... saying don't recommend them? And then <laughs> heartily. <laughs> you don't think that Ruth? P it's a little bit suspicious with Ruth Ruth Payne's actions. I mean, I don't know if you've seen Max Good's documentary on some things. Yes. But, yes. Uh, I've talked to him about it, but I also think it's weird. Like, didn't she burn mail? And I'm like, even if you're, I think the ex explanation is like, well, she's a Quaker or something like that. I don't think you know it's illegal to burn mail, whether you got the assassin in there, too. It's the same reason I put blame on Hostie for destroying the note on the captain's orders about Oswald allegedly threatening to blow up the um, Dallas FBI headquarters or something like that. Like, it doesn't matter. It's like that's destruction of evidence, whether it was intended to or not. Well, there's there's a, a there, there's probably four or five things that Ruth has to explain that she has not adequately explained. Uh, one is that what you just described there about destroying mail that came after Lee was arrested. Okay. And she said, well, it was, it was subversive magazines. Well, she had allowed those magazines to be coming to her home for several weeks. And then all of a sudden she's going to decide on her own to do that. Uh, and so she has to explain that she has to explain the whole typewriter in her home situation and the letter that was allegedly typed on it that was sent to the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C. by Lee uh, within j just a few weeks before the assassination. She has to explain how um, her, why she viewed Lee the way she did. Uh, Lee, to me, Lee was quite the chameleon and could reveal what he wanted to about himself to different people so that he could help inform their decision about him and what how they would describe him to somebody and uh and she has more information about um uh, that relationship that she had with lee and the conversation that she had than i think she's told so i've talked with max about the typewriter um he told me that she told him when he asked her about it that she had donated it to um, a Nicaragua help group or something. So it's like, we'll probably never find that crazy typewriter now at this point um, with it. So, yeah, I I, th I do not think, you know, I, I've gone maybe 100 degrees from where I was originally was on Ruth Payne, which was if you'd asked me 20. 25 years ago, I thought that she had her hands in this very deeply. Now, I do not believe that the evidence really shows that, uh, but it does show her with some questionable activities. And she may be more of an unwitting individual of, of, of assisting in the conspirators plot. Uh, and uh, she was too naive. And as time went on, she didn't want to admit that she was too naive to have understood what was how she that. was being manipulated. So that's how I've kind of come with Ruth Payne. But she hasn't. She still has a number of things to explain to us. And uh, I'm, I, I support Max work. I I joined that Patreon so that I could, you know, donate each month because I think his his continued work is important. Even though she'll never talk to him again. I um. 
I agree with uh, the, the unwitting aspect of Ruth Payne's involvement in some things, but what made you change the 100 degree direction? Well, well I had a one-on-one -on -one interview with her. And for one thing, when you, when you actually can talk with people, especially in person, and I, I went, I went to Florida when she, back when she lived in Florida, uh, that was in 1997. And I had, uh, I had spent an evening with her, and then the next day I spent another three, four hours with her. And uh, over the course of talking about her, I got her body language, I got her direct response, I got where she paused, I got all of those type of things. Uh, and and I asked some hard questions to her um, at the time, and um, I I came away from that doing a lot more reading on her uh, about her personality and about her interactions, her social interactions, et cetera, and came to the conclusion that she really, she really wasn't um, directing Oswald in any way. I didn't think she had the personality or the capability to be able to do that because Oswald was very independent uh, and very sharp, very sharp. Um, so through the course, it took me evolved over several years. And David Lifton and I had many conversations because he had done a deep dive interview with Michael and I had done Ruth. And so we sat down and we compared notes and we talked about nuances and, and different things like that. Uh, in 1999, he had done Michael's interview, I think in 95. So it was quite fascinating to get two perspectives and a man and a woman's perspective about how the interviews went uh, and that, and that kind of helped me evolve. And I think David evolved uh, a little later. I think that he was a little later in coming to a conclusion similar to mine. You think um, when it comes to, I know, I know people say like, She's 80, 90 years old and you shouldn't be badgering her. And I'm sure it's hard dealing with conspiracy stuff too. But I also think if you open yourself up to talking about it when it's just a normal scripted kind of six floor museum style, non-conspiracy related interview, you kind of open up that door for criticism. Like just don't do any interviews then, you know, I mean, well, I, but then you, then you'd be saying, why won't she talk to people? That's true. Yeah. But then that puts more blame on the conspiracy. It's people. the interviewer's fault. Because if you're just going to throw her puff questions, she's going to give you puff answers. Okay. But you can tell when she's being interviewed and uh, she doesn't want to talk about something, you, you see the mask come on. And it's very apparent in that body language that she has an answer. She has information, but she's not going to share it. And so um, I think that's why Max's work that he's done is so important because he captured some of that. And you can see her influence over Michael in those interviews that he she did he didn't put in the um in the film. Okay. When he had the one-on-one -on -one with Michael, um, towards the tail end of it, it um Michael starts going off on this whole little philosophy of, oh, you know what? Maybe um maybe there could have been someone else shooting at the same time but it had nothing to do with with lee it just happened that at the same moment someone else decided to shoot at the president too now you know he's old so he doesn't even realize how bizarre that sounds right and how that would strain uh uh the uh, the average person or the reasonable person uh, to agree with that perspective. But the fact that he said it when Ruth was out of the room, okay, uh, and not there with Max uh, on the interview, uh, that speaks uh, about Michael's ability to, you know, uh, do a little free thought on his own uh, rather than articles that she's pushing toward him. Read this article, it's really good. Read this one and that. And so you can see that uh, she has taken advantage of his uh, dementia to uh, to more incorporate you know her thinking in into his. But he was still, gee, maybe it could be. <laughs> I think you know my stance on Ruth Payne. I don't think you need to get her 
uh, involved at all to understand that there was something weird going on about the whole assassination narrative in general. I don't, don't think you need her. I don't think you need George Mornshield. I don't think you need Roger Craig. I don't think you need a bunch of other people. There's just clear if you're looking right at the case and kind of looking at it from like a common sense point of view, there's a lot of weird abnormalities that really don't make sense. And that only expands more when you look at the whole Cold War in general and the concepts that are going around there. But I mean, was there anything to you like the the blanket or anything that they found Lee's rifle or uh, Lee, the cops going there, her going to the grocery store multiple times? I mean, did you ever try and find if there was a possibility that, I don't know, that there was more of a logical explanation of like distraughtness, I would understand of going to the grocery store multiple times. It doesn't seem super suspicious. But also she's, the type I've gotten from her was like, she knew exactly what was going on in her house. How did she not know that there was a rifle in there? Uh, I'll go back to the Quaker. Okay. She, um, she was just adamant when I talked with her about not wanting rifles or any types of guns anywhere around her kids. And that she denied them even to have a toy gun, her little boy, Chris. Okay. And she's told me that, um, it, she was so against it and she felt she was right and she had knew other young mothers who felt the same way and she was very very happy to hear that 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 when they went over to their houses she knew they wouldn't have toy weapons and things like that and she said one day she came in and her son was sitting on the floor with his little plastic barnyard animals and he had picked up like a pig and was aiming it at the cow and going, eh, eh, like, like the pig was a gun, right? And she said, I just threw up my arms like, what can you do? Somehow they see information and you're trying to protect them from seeing things. I think if she had known there was a rifle in that garage, she would have told them to remove it. That they could not keep that rifle in that garage. Now, Michael, I believe, knew darn well that there was a rifle in that garage that when he had to step on that blanket to get to his saw he knew what that was he had been in the military he had handled firearms he wasn't a hunter but he knew what a rifle was like compared to camping equipment so i think there's two very different stories there between ruth and michael and when and one of the key things that i think with ruth was when they came that first day on Friday, and she said they want to know if there's a rifle, and Marina says, yes, he has a rifle. Ruth almost fainted. She was so shocked that Marina was saying that there was a rifle in the garage, and here they're, they're like 10 feet away from it, uh, and she has her two children in the house, and Marina has two children in the house. And so um, I think I, I think there's a dichotomy between Michael and Ruth on that topic. Do you think that Michael was involved in some way as much as people assume that Ruth was involved in some way? Because I, I, I handle it from this aspect of things. If Ruth knew a little bit and she understood because Michael had told her, which if you look at like Sidney Gottlieb, for instance, the guy in charge of MK Ultra, Stephen Kinzer wrote a biography about um, him. He was a different guy when he clocked out of work from drugging random people. He was a guy who read poems and garden and stuff like that. His He told his wife everything when he came home from work. Guys usually don't talk about certain things uh, when it comes to like issues that they're experiencing. It just seems like, I don't know, if it's the culture of being a man or whatever it's called. But you confide with someone when you experience something. And usually that's someone that you either marry or someone that you're very, very close to. Sometimes it can be a child as well, too, if you, you trust your kid enough to hear a story. So I'm just curious if Michael knew a lot of like, yeah, there was a rifle in the garage and this type of stuff, and Ruth had already denied it. So she then started finding out like, okay, I guess there's a lot more than I don't know about. I mean, based on your interview um, or your interviews with them or – her sliding articles to Michael or anything of that sort. I mean, don't you think that's like she was trying to help Michael get out of a situation as well, too? Not like they were both in charge of the plot or anything like that, but they knew information that they had maybe learned later or she had learned later after she gave statements. And now it was about protecting someone that you used to care a lot about. Does that make a little bit of sense? Um, it does, uh, except... Uh, I would disagree because I've met her. I've met her and I've spent time with her and I've broken bread with her. And 
I think um uh I I think that remember they were separated at the time, okay? And Michael it, it, Michael was absolutely not wanting to be in that marriage anymore. He I I doubt that he ever even wanted the two children, okay? Ruth especially at that age that she was, was a very trusting person. And everything's going to, looking at life as if you do good and you're good to people, people will be good to you and life will go on and everything will be wonderful. So she has this opportunity with Marina, who's also having marital difficulties and they can talk turkey with each other about men and all that that implies in an unsuccessful relationship, plus having young children that you have, that's the father of my children, and yet you still can't live together. Um, they had those things in common. So I think that um, Michael liked to talk politics. He liked to envision himself somewhat in the character of his father, not believing in the same things but um uh, at least being politically minded and 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 educated enough to be able to to discuss politics and uh in in a meaningful way and he found that with lee but lee was very adamant about his own beliefs and lee d lee wanted to lecture not debate because lee had his own views and he wanted to do that michael wanted to debate Michael wanted to have a conversation about different types of political thought and action, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, Michael believed in war to serve enough to go and serve in Korea during that war. Uh, and um, even as a, he, he wasn't a Quaker, he was a um, Unitarian. And so I think that he, um, he just had a different perspective on it all. And his view of Oswald was the view that Oswald showed him. Ruth's view of Oswald was the Oswald that he showed her. And then she had the image of Oswald from Marina. So she blended all those things together to, uh, to try to figure this young man out. Um, but I don't think that Michael was um, part of a conspiracy. Do you think that Marina unwitting, unwitting, yes. Do you think that Ruth and Oswald do you do they know if they had a good relationship? I've heard that they didn't. Um, but it was just weird because Oswald stayed at the house some nights. And also there's the statement from the interrogation where they point out the Rambler station wagon and Oswald says that's Ruth Payne, you leave her out of this. Right. But you know, how how much can we believe about the interrogations? It's true. Wasn't taped. Was the stenographer, stenographer wasn't in the room. We have Warren Commission supposed statements and uh, testimony that there was a stenographer in the room, and yet they still changed that. So we we uh, when I see these stories about here's the interrogation of Oswald, here's his his last forty eight hours, and they list all these things that Fritz said or Bookout said or um, Post. It, yeah, hosty. Yeah. Uh it's like hmm some of it's really convenient. Uh and uh I, I, I don't know how much I believe the 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 what Lee was alleged to have said. Do you believe that the boy that he walked to or walked with to the barber shop, that little boy that um Shasty he's he ended up becoming famous or something, didn't he? Oh well he yeah, he was in Star Wars. <laughs> He wasn't a big role, but it was a fighter pilot. Yeah. That was the boy that she taught Russian to. I Did can't he, think of his name right now. Does that not strike you quirky about his personality if he's hanging out with a young child? Um, he is a, known as a loser type is what they painted him out to be. So I'm just wondering. I mean, he knew a lot of people, though. I've heard like people that were associated with like Minutemen and all this ideas that get tossed out there. So I'm like – he could if he really didn't talk to people if he was a little bit isolated i mean is it is it that it fit his character of hanging out with so did he hang out with this boy did was he seen by a barber at a barber shop any of these types of things make sense 
Um, I think everybody shows different sides of themselves to different people. My work person was different than my home person. My going out for drinks with girlfriends was different than both of those. Uh, Co-workers of Lee at Riley Coffee in New Orleans describe a totally different person than the person that worked at the depository. Uh, uh, and there were a lot of people talking, uh, at, you know, being asked afterwards uh, about his his personality and how he behaved. So I think that uh, I can believe that he went to that barbershop with that boy. Uh, Ruth had to pick him up to take him to St. Mark's for the, the Russian language lessons and that. So there was legitimate reason for him to be in the area. Uh, Dallas environs was a hotbed of racist, conservative political thought. So the fact that a boy that young would be hearing his parents uh, spout certain political views, et cetera, and then try to palm them off as his own, that doesn't surprise me at all. Okay. I mean, even when you hear Roy truly, you know, the one of the managers at the depository talk about um, his uh, ends, he, you know, he used the word, right? My ends, uh, I take care of them. He goes, even though they're all lazy and superstitious and don't work very hard. <laughs> it's like, I talked to some of the white depository employ, uh, employees and they're like, no, those guys hung right in there. They, they work just as hard as, you know, other people in that. But if you've got the bent of racism, or conservative political thought, you, you you just state it blatantly because you feel you're so much in the right. Uh, and in in Texas, they weren't shy about that. I mean, that's why they have the treason uh, ad in the paper the day the president comes. Like I said, it makes it very complicated because then you have a guy that tries to give a rifle to go get a car or fix Ruth Payne's car. You have a guy that takes a shot at a firing range saying this is what he's going to do to the president shooting other people's targets. You have a guy that tries to buy, I don't know if it was buy a car or test drive a car, even though Oswald didn't have a license. So I'm sure someone was using his name 100 percent. I'm pretty sure on that. Uh, but that makes him even harder to figure out who he was, which I mean, I, I like your chameleon thing. I think that's possible. But there's a lot of things like you need a driver's license if you're going to even skepticize of trying to test drive a car. You can get arrested for driving without a license. And I'm pretty sure you didn't want to be arrested by Dallas police back then. Right. Well, and, and what dealer would let you take it out without the license, right? I mean, you know, they wouldn't let you take the car out to test drive it either um, without it. So, you, you know, um, there there is one thing that I heard Tink Thompson say that does make sense, that when you scrutinize something under a microscope, that people just thought was normal activity. When you get into that level of scrutinizing it, uh, who among us could stand up to that? That you could justify everything that you did yesterday, uh, even account for your time yesterday, um, a week before some catastrophic event happened, uh, account for all of that. Um, now, if you're like Ruth Payne and you've got a little calendar that you mark stuff down all the time, uh, that's helpful because that jogs your memory about certain things. But uh, th the way people do things, the way people talk, uh, the people they associate, et cetera, uh, could we all stand up under incredible scrutiny uh, and, and look at this case, the aspects of it that we uh, try to figure out and try to um, scrutinize to that teeny tiny level. And it's important. It's important because we've been given so much disinformation. And maybe we can appreciate that. The, the new generation today maybe can appreciate what they've seen over the last seven years of misinformation coming at them. And then I wonder, do they even understand that? When there's such a preponderance of misinformation, where do you go? What what do you believe? 
And I wonder if the new generation struggles with that. And they look at this as like, hey, this happened 60 years ago. You know, I'm sorry someone died that day, but, you know, gosh, look, we've had a lot of presidents since then, and we're still a big country and all of that. Do they really understand, you know, what, what's at risk in this country and how it does stem from that that event? I trust the people that I talk to about the case when I can actually understand who you are. And that's why I sent you an email saying I respect your research as well, too, because I think you give some more plausible takes on some things and it always being a, I'm always tired of it ending in the grand conspiracy angle of things it gets a little bit uh, nuts for me um, but I think there is conspiracy it's just about finding and defining what that is I mean the real message here is is about when you talk about document manipulation or things to fit a narrative is it because you're doing it as a patriot is it because you're thinking of it as a different mindset the issue with conspiracy is finding out if a lot of this stuff was done intentionally with a more nefarious act. That's where the conspiracy comes in. It doesn't need to be a question of if there's conspiracy. There's plenty of evidence of a cover-up. It's just about what was that cover-up? Why did it have to be Oswald? Why did it have to be a lone nut? Because you didn't want to look for Cuba. You didn't want to look into Russia. You didn't want to have to do a bunch of things that the public felt like they needed a justified answer or some payment on. I have no clue. But then if you believe the military-industrial complex... Their track record isn't good. Fred Hampton assassination. I mean, a bunch of things that start going down where you start going, look, just because it's the color of a skin and we accept that it's wrong rights or wrong history towards one person, they can do the same thing at any moment. Just like my buddy Yorg, who had his house raided by the FBI. They don't care. It's If they label you something, they will do what they can. And sadly, in this country, much like communism back in the day, if you just label something domestic terrorist, everyone's like, go ahead. Take care of that person for me. And there's no there's no legal rights anymore. I mean, I bring this up with the it's a large stretch, but I do defend it. It's the Manson trial thing. I don't believe Manson should have been. Con I mean, I, I believe Manson should have been convicted. He was crazy. But there was also perjury in the trial on Vincent Bugilosi's side by putting a prosecutor on the defendant's side. Now, if you care about the rights that you are entitled to as a citizen, no matter how crazy you are, you deserve a right to a fair trial. And I stand in that boat. Now, I don't believe that Manson should have been out on anything, but I do talk about that equal rights, no matter what the person or who the person is, you deserve – those are rights that are entitled to you, which means fair, and that's the problem with court cases. I mean it's – court cases now have turned into a game. It's not about the truth anymore. It's about I got to win this because I can't lose. And that's a really dangerous route to go into this country. So when you talk about the younger generations and misinformation, things like this, I'm just more susceptible to understanding that people are going to lie to me. Now, what I believe in the truth is when I can actually sit down and talk with the person and be able to define what that thing is. And I don't really trust articles. I don't trust documents a whole lot either. But if I can talk to you about it and you can show me your perspective on things, helps me understand it more. But trying to solve the case i think everyone's just really got to stop focusing on that so much and just worried about what we can really get done and that's getting documents that is getting a public interest into it because my generation out of any generation is one for change that's one that will be as activist as hell to get the answer on some things i believe the other generations did do stuff but that whole purpose of like i think i've seen more change out of this generation and i've heard it from other generations too and I've talked about this generation is very active in the way that it goes about things. Mm -hmm. I uh, I think that uh, well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm I'm glad to hear that that's your perspective uh, because you have a lot of contact with a lot of people. Uh, so it's it's positive to hear that because it's very easy to get discouraged when you're working in your little bubble in your own study and you're. You've got boxes of files and you're trying to make connections between things or or eliminate potential connections because, you know, that's probably more of what I do is eliminate the the what I call the wrong thinking, how we've gone down a wrong path on something. I try to eliminate that. So that then people can focus. That's why I think people like John Newman and. Um, Alan, the, the the fellow that helps him a lot, uh, Jim Lazar, Alan Dale, yes, um, Jim Lazar, uh, uh, Bart doing the, the logistics of getting that that archive up, um, and that David Josephs, 
Sorry. David Josephs. Yes. So those those I think they are absolutely great about persevering on this military intelligence uh, aspect of um, how policy making and activities in the United States were conducted at that time period. And, you know, Armstrong's done incredible interviews with Alan and, and like you said, getting Bart talking with Malcolm to get that down on the record. That's terrific. Uh, Malcolm has helped me immeasurably over the years. If he ever found something on George, um, I would get a copy of it. <laughs> Just very, very kind. And I know he's taking a break right now. And God bless him. He deserves it. Uh, I, I feel like I'm racing against the clock. And so uh, I, I, I need to just keep forging forward uh, to do whatever contribution I can and leave behind. Uh, but I, I certainly hope that they're uh, in the new generation that they, uh, an, an appreciation for what was lost and how we veered off the track and I'm not saying it was all rosy and everything's wonderful, right? Because I don't want, I, I'm not a make America like the John Kennedy era again. I'm not going to put that cap on uh, because there's there's a, there were a lot of things that I didn't approve of or think were good for the country. But um, uh, where we've headed since uh, is, 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 in my opinion, is pretty dire uh, and the position that Americans have been put in of giving up their freedoms uh, in the name of patriotism because of terrorists, right? And not recognizing that domestic terrorism is as important as foreign terrorism uh, is is a is a is a big problem, I think, for us. Um, Nancy, you've given me enough of your time. I appreciate you doing my show again, but is there a place where people can find your links? And I'm I want to have to have you back on to talk about that project when it gets all done. <laughs> when so. it's time. Uh, uh, yeah, Amazon, uh, the Faux Baron, um, the life of George Damar and Schelt. And uh, I heartily, rec heartily recommend the um, print edition because it has uh uh, dozens of pages of endnotes and footnotes that further augment uh, information on the political environment of of the era and some of some important links associated with that. And I'm going to link all those links in the description for people to be able to click on. Nancy, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk again on my show. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.